Okay, so thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. We are talking about uh, Creative Europe, yes, and its multiple um, approaches. Um, because m most, most of you will think about Creative Europe as simply a grant uh, program from the, the European community, but it is not just a grant uh, program, it has an all ecosystem that it looks at, and I am mainly going to speak, so it, as we thought we would do this, I'm mainly going to speak about the strands, so what is already here, what, what's going on, and how, how can you benefit from it, and then Matthew will speak about some uh, interesting uh, other initiatives other than, uh, than the grants. So, first of all, I would like to contextualize, and what I would like to, I, I, I will understand, I'm too short. Uh, what I would like to, my objective with this session was for you to understand in a simple enough manner if you have projects that can be submitted to the Creative Europe. If you don't have a project or you're not prepared now, how can you prepare to do it in the future? So I will not stick to the basics, percentages, and all that you can see in regulations, but I would like to give you a little bit of the do's and don'ts and how to make your, how to help you to make your application successful. But first of all, I have to contextualize. So Creative Europe is the, as I, I was saying, is the European Union's program for the cultural sector. It is exclusive for the cultural sector. It is small, it is probably the smallest program the, the Commission has. Uh, just for you to have a notion, Horizon 2020 for research has 80 billion for the duration of the, the framework, which is seven years, and we have 1.5 billion. That means for the seven years and for all the European countries. But still, it has its advantages to have our own program, and uh, for starters, only entities from the cultural sector can apply to this program. It's not about tourism coming to get some money from the cultural sector, it's not any other. Spillovers are fine. Projects including education and culture, in this case music, or programs including um, tourism and culture are fine, but the ones that apply and the project itself has to be about the cultural sector and has to bring a benefit to the cultural sector. So this is a, a big plus. Uh, then another very interesting thing is that it's not a, it's not a program like most programs. And those of you who know Portugal Vint Vint and the structural funds know that you have to pay and then be reimbursed. It's not about that. With Creative Europe, uh, 30 days after you sign the agreement, they will release 40% at least uh, and up to 70% of the money that you will get, or the financing money, which will give you some margin to start your project as you look for further financing, for example. Uh, and and the, the very interesting thing also is that since it's focusing on culture, it, it, it's, it's always focusing on culture. That means that it has been evolving. It started actually in previous frameworks with the culture program. I don't know if you, any of you have heard about the culture program. It, it has been around for almost 20 years. Uh, and from the culture program to the Creative Europe program, many things have changed. It's been more sector oriented, it's been more, more business oriented too, or rather creating margin for most business or most business oriented uh, projects, which is good. And in that spirit, it uh, launched in 2015, I think the conversation starts about the initiative which is very interesting for this, uh, this event called Music Moves Europe. I'm not going to talk about Music Moves Europe now, that will be Matthew's job, but uh, still, it is within the frame of the Creative Europe that this is happening and that will frame the next uh, program, the post-2020 programs of uh, support to the cultural sector. Another thing that what you and I will talk about is the Guarantee Facility uh, Fund. Yesterday I told people not to talk about fund with the European Investment Fund, but is the Cultural and Creative Sector Guarantee Facility. That's what it's called, and it's money for to help banks have a, a different look into the cultural sector and facilitate loans to the to SMEs. We'll talk about that later. Now, coming back to the schemes, this will take place between 2014 and 2020, and as I said, comes from previous programs. So, 
The way Creative Europe is organized is it has two sub-programs. One sub-program called Media, which is ex exclusively for cinema and television, and another one called Culture, which is for all the other cultural expressions, including, of course, music. That's what we are going to focus about. It also has a cross-sector um, scheme that, uh, for instance, supports the capitals of culture, which Guimarães has been in 2012, uh, and supports the EBA Awards. I guess you all have heard about, heard about that. And also the Creative Europe Desks, which is where I came in. So Creative Europe has information desks in every country that participates in the program to help you with the applications. So this is why, why, why I exist and my colleagues exist, to help you identify the best scheme for your project, how can you learn to speak Brussels, let's <laughs> say, <laughs> and uh, that's our job. So first of all, if you have any doubts, if you just after this presentation, you think that maybe I have a project, just come and talk to me or talk to the Creative Europe Desk in your country. Uh, okay, so culture sub program. The most interesting thing about culture sub program for me is that it's, it's, it's fle flexibility actually. It has no constraints in terms of format or methodology. It has, of course, a number of priorities. Like any other funding program, it, it has some priorities, it has some objectives that it wishes to promote. And your job is to say, I'm a cultural agent, me and my partners, we'll get to that. We're cultural agents, we have this project with these cultural activities. These cultural activities will aim for one or a number of your, these priorities and why. So this is your job when you're doing the application. There's no constraints in terms of percentages of money used, you can only use, like some programs have that problem, that you can only use 20% for human resources and 20% for traveling, or Creative Europe doesn't have that because the multiplicity of projects that he allows to, it made it impossible to have such a thing. So it's up to you to say, I'm the cultural agent, I know what I need, I know what the sector needs, this is the best way to do it, and I'm gonna tell you why in my application. So, you'll see that another good thing of having an exclusively, a program exclusively for the cultural sector is that the priorities meet the needs of the sector. Of course, there's always place for improvement, but I, uh, I would say that dif with difficulty, only with difficulty, you will not find yourselves within this, one of these priorities. So, five priorities. Transnational mobility, it's all about internationalization of career, of professionals, uh, career opportunities, creation and production, accessing new markets. So this is, I think, all of us here uh, understand a little bit of this. And also, what you need to know is when you select this priority, because you always will have to identify the priority or priorities that you select, you'll have to understand that this transnational mobility have to incorporate activities beyond the shows and beyond all those things, networking activities, activities that actually will help the, um, the artists internationalize their careers. We'll get a little bit into that. This is the first one. The second one is audience development. We're not talking just projects that will aim for very large audiences, that's not the aim here. The aim here is to develop activities where you can broaden your audiences or fidelize your audi audiences in every for the format that you wish or think better for your business. Um, a particularity about this, uh, this, this priority, which is not always immediately perceived, is that uh, you have to have some activities that are not only for the audience, but with the audiences, involving the audiences somehow. It doesn't have to be in all the activities, but join in the activities of your project, something that actually involves the audience. Another one, training and education. This one is more business orientated. So it means uh, it's not 
training and education for artists itself, for the art of the artists, for learning how to play or learning, but it is more for the, um, the, cult the agents, the cultural agents, how to professionalize, how to better then uh, fa face the challenges that the, the, the sector is facing, sorry for the redundancy. Um, so this is another, another priority. There is another one called new business models. And this one, uh, people find it a bit strange. What is this new business models in a financing program? What does this mean? Yes, Creative Europe has this priority. So it's looking not only at small associations from, with no profit, uh, not, no profit uh, objectives, but also for the entire sector. And this is creating projects in which activities cre help you to find new ways of revenue or how to work more efficiently and therefore have more, re more revenue or more spare money. Digitization is actually about using digital technologies in art. Whatever phase of the process, creation, production, distribution, whatever, this is a big plus. Of course, you can mix all these priorities. You don't have to choose one and focus on one. You can have a project that uh, mix all this, these priorities to hand to a, to a global goal. So these are the priorities, and now, as I was saying, there are multiples, multiple ways to achieve them. You don't, you don't, as I said before, there's no format, there's no methodology. Tell them what you think is better. Okay, how is this done? This is done through four schemes. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk exhaustively about all four schemes. We're talking, we will be going to be talking mainly about European cooperation projects. And I'll tell you why, because European networks and European platforms will no longer open any other calls. Calls are closed. We are, talk, we are going to talk because you can apply to the, to the beneficiaries, to the projects that have been selected. We'll get to that. To that. And literary translation is only for fiction books, and I don't think you'll be interested in. So we are going to focus in cooperation projects, which is the more flexible and the more where it's the, the scheme where all those objectives we talked about fit. There are some transversal considerations, though, that you have to keep in mind when thinking that do I have a project or can I apply to Creative Europe? It's a co-financing model. It's not. It doesn't finance your project in 100%. The percentages differ from scheme to scheme. We'll get to that. You need to be a legal person. So artists cannot apply themselves, but they can associate to a company or someone that they, they know and work with and present the project through that entity. It works, it, you have to be working in the creative and cultural sector and with proof of that. It does, it, it, it's not enough to have just in your, on your commercial registration and then not have any activities for the last two years. You really need to, to be hands-on the sector. Uh, this, it has, this, is, this first constraint. Creative Europe only supports transnational projects. So the, the European Commission doesn't have any competences in the member states as far as culture and education is concerned. So logically, a, project, a program for the cultural sector needs to, to be transversal and needs to, to support projects that, that has an European added value. So we're talking about internationalization here, which is, I think, good. We're talking about non-profit projects. How, does it, how is it coherent with what I just said about new business model? So being non-profit doesn't mean that you don't have, non, cannot have a revenue in the project. You can have revenue in the project. You cannot have profit. So you have to reinvest that money in the project. And the money that you generate within the project during the duration of the project, um, it's part of your part of, of the funding. We'll get to that afterwards. Plus, if you have a project that will not generate money within the duration while it's being executed, but it, the, the, it will result, after the project is finished, in profit, that's fine. That's great. The, the commission doesn't have, well, it's welcome. It's not a problem at all. It means it's sustainable. The project, it means it's, the, the, the project is sustainable, so it's a plus. 
who can participate? So, state members, of course, all the state members. Then the EFTA countries, only Iceland and Norway. Switzerland is, is not participating in the program. Liechtenstein didn't want to participate in the program. Also, countries that are candidates. So this list and the next list, countries under the European neighborhood policy, keeps on growing. All they, want, they need is to want to sign an agreement and as soon as they sign it, they are in the program. That's hopefully what will happen with the UK after Brexit. Um, <laughs> yes, it's, it is a problem. But I'm sure it will happen. I'm not worried about that. The last one to sign the agreement was Tunisia. And in, on our website, create, in the Creative Europe Central website, uh, you have the list that is being updated as soon as the, 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 the agreements are signed. I think the uh, next one in line is Armenia. OK, what about third countries? What about countries that are not in this group? Third countries can participate in Creative Europe. But to participate, you need a minimum for each scheme of those countries. And then the third countries will come afterwards. So you will need a minimum of three countries, three entities from three different countries then you can have a fourth country that it's not within that group. That can happen. I'm not going to get too much into it. If you have doubts, then we will, uh, can talk. What about the European cooperation projects? So basically, we have two categories, small scale projects and large scale projects. This is the basis. Throughout the program, there has been opening. They used this line sometimes to open a third category. Last one was. Uh, heritage because of the European Year for Cultural Heritage and the year before was about projects to help uh, to work with migrants uh, but basically normally there are two categories opening small and large scale small scale port projects three partners from three different countries one leader plus two co-financing is 60% of the total costs and is up to 200,000. So we're talking about maximum projects of 320, 330,000 to be co-financing 200,000, and then you'll need your match funding in 120,000. Large-scale projects, six partners, one leader plus five partners from six different countries, the same logic. Here, the co-financing is 50% of the costs, up to 2 million. So we're talking about total 4 million, co-financing 2 million. When I say uh, two million, uh, 4 million project, the project can be more than 4 million. It can be 10 million, and then you will, you will apply, you will receive 2 million. It's not going to be 50%, but that is possible. It's not, it's not a problem. Needless is, well, not needless. I think I need to say that I'm talking about maximum, but we have selected projects that go from asking 60,000 euros to projects that ask 2 million euros. All have been selected. So it's not about who has the bigger project, who has the bigger ambition. You need to have ambition, but you need to have ambition in your own scale. So what they are going to, be, to assess is within your scale, within this scale, how much good can this project, how, how well is it designed? How, how, how much it can impact the cultural sector? And how well the application is designed, of course. That's, that's a crucial part. OK, so first thing that you won't find in the regulation, on the, in the guidelines, as we say, the fact that there is a leader normally uh, takes people, uh, induces people in a wrong way. The, having a leader doesn't mean that that entity is the owner of the project. Okay? It has to be a real partnership, and this is in the guidelines. And being a real partnership means, partnership means that all partners must contribute in an equally relevant way to the project. It's not enough to have someone to sign the project for you saying that it's in. Then the activities that they're actually going to put into the projects will be assessed and then they will see if this is a real partnership or not. So all partners have to be equally relevant to the project. They don't have to do 
all the same thing or all at the same time. Projects can have up to 48 months, that's four years. But what they do, you must argue that it's relevant for the project. That's the thing. Once again, the, it's not the commission. The commission will not decide just because they think there's a quota of X percent of activities. No, it's up to you to say, this is maybe not as many activities, but for my end goal, this is equally re relevant to all my 30 or 20 activities that I met that I want to do. Okay, so this means that partners are not mere, mere service providers. This is a, uh, sometimes a doubt that people uh, uh, People sometimes ask me about this when we are talking. Service providing is, of course, in general terms, a partnership, but as far as the program is concerned, it's not a partnership. And this also means that if everyone has to be a relevant activity in the project because everyone is contributing and everyone is coherent with the objectives. So I have a project with a number of activities that is, I'm saying this is coherent with your priorities and I'm picking the best partners possible to develop those activities. You will have to demonstrate the added value of each partner in the application. So I'm choosing this partner because he's good at this. He will bring this input that I wouldn't have otherwise and so on and so forth. That's what it means. About the match funding. Okay, this is a responsibility of the partnership. Once again, the leader is not the owner, is not the only one responsible for this. The leader is responsible for all the administrative aspects, is responsible for applying, for submitting the application, but still, is also responsible for receiving the money, for distributing the money, and for guaranteeing that everything goes smoothly that every activity is being dealt with in an efficient way, but it does not on the partner. We have selected projects, so this is not theoretical, this is happening, where the leader takes over the 40% or the 50%. It's not a problem because the other partners don't have the, the capacity. We have projects, selected projects, where there's a distribution, um, equitative, is this a word? Equitative distribution, where everyone, <laughs> okay. Uh, sometimes there's some false friends between the Portuguese and the English language, and I'm never, sometimes I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and we have some projects where every partner participates, but not, but in different, with different amounts. So whatever works for the partnership. It's not a problem, it's not a problem at all. And then this match funding you can find either from your own revenues, from your own profit that you already have, from sponsorship, um, applying to other grants, to other entities, uh, public or not. Uh, the commission is not uh, complicated about it. The only thing that it's not possible is to have double EU financing. So imagine you are applying for another program, Erasmus, and applying for Creative Europe. You can do it. Complementary is possible, but it has to be clear which part those different programs are financing. Basically, you, they don't want to take the risk that you are receiving twice for the same activity and for the same, for the same person. OK, now what about the EU funding? As I said before, one of the, the, the advantages of having, having a, a, a program like this is the release of a part of so, so, some, sometimes a substantial part of the of the of the co-financing. It can can go up to 70 percent. It depends on the schemes. Um, in this scheme, it differs from if it's a, a small scale, they will free 70 percent. If it's a large scale, they will free 40 percent. We can then, if you have doubts, talk about how this is done and so on. I will not get into that detail right now. <coughs> but this means what? This means that you actually, when you are applying, you don't need to have your match funding assured. I mean, you don't need to, to, to say, I already have the money. I already have the 40% the, the or the 50%. What you say is that you, ha you compromise that you will have that money. And this is po possible when you are applying, because then you will receive this money and you can you have one or two years to find uh, another financing. Also, you can have an entity that says, okay, I'll, I'll give you some money, I will invest in your project, but not 
in the first, first year. I'll only be able to do that in the second year. That's okay. You will apply and in the second year, then you will get the money. Having said that, that you can do this in the application stage, it, it may have an impact as far as evaluation is concerned. If a project is two projects that are equally relevant, equally good, everything's good, but one has already has the money and the other is still going to find the money, that may, they, they, that may uh, prevent you from getting selected. Okay, so what you need to do is, this is not in the regulations, if you have some entity that will give you the money, have them write a letter saying, I commit to give this money, the money to this entity, even if it's so, if it gets the Creative Europe support. This is not in the regulation, but you can do it. You just attach it to the application, and then your, your application will be looked at with different eyes. <coughs> okay, we have talked about this criteria. The award criteria. As you can see, there are only four award criteria. We've talked about three of them. Relevance. How is your project coherent with the priorities? We talked about that. Is it coherent or is not coherent? 30 points. Quality of content and activities. This means that you have to have a production plan about the entire project. And this is not so clear, I think, in the guidelines, because normally what happens is cultural agents look at the guidelines and think that they are talking only about the, the culture, the actual cultural activities. But no, you have to have a production production plan for the entire project, so meeting with the with partners uh, and explaining that you are doing the project, developing with the, the, the certain strategy, and that that strategy is leading you to your end goal and how it is, will be leading you to the end goal. Here also, very important is the budget. How do, how do you organize your budget? You have a template, of course, but the budget has to be described per partner. So every partner has to identify clearly the activities that will translate in costs. So everything has to be absolutely planned. I'm not going to uh, tell you that this is uh, just a stroll in the park. It's not. Administratively, it's it's, it's very simple, simple compared to other programs that I have applied to even. So they are not too complicated about that. Only if you get selected, then they will ask you a bunch of other documents, but you don't have to worry about that during the application process, which is, which is good. But you have to have a fully closed thought project. There, there's no margin for maybe I'll do this, or maybe I'll do that. It's, it is what it is. It is the best thing in the world. My partners are the best, and this is how you have to present it. Then it not to lie, of course, because otherwise, then if you don't, if you don't <laughs> deliver what you are saying, it could, it could be a problem. But this is how we have to think about our application. Don't worry, there is a margin. Once the project is selected, there is a margin for small changes because you know, it's, it can be a four-year plan, so things can happen. So best thing is to, when in doubt, just say exactly what you think would be, you would like to do. And then if there is a certain amount of uh, alterations you need to do, they will give you a project officer and they, he will help you in the process of doing some adjustments to your application, okay? No buts, no, no ifs, no maybes. What we did, we talked about quality of the partnership. When I said that you need to be, your partners need to be coherent with what you would like to do. So this is where this criteria will assess that added value of each partner. What we didn't talk about is communication and dissemination. And please don't think this is a smaller part of your application. It is a big part of your application. Normally applications are about 82, 84 points need 82, 84 points to be selected. And if you, if you don't have, even if you're very good at the others, you only have 80, that will not be possible. You need to take a, a good look at this. But the, what does this mean? Before, what the programs wanted was to see if you did, you, did you do all the activities you proposed? Yes, 
did you pay everyone and do you have the receipt? Yes, okay, so all is good. Now, you need to show in your application that you have a communication plan, that you will communicate your project to the audience. No one's going to come and see if it resulted and if you have big numbers in the rooms or whatever, but they need to know that you know this is, this is necessary. You need to have a plan to reach your audience, whatever that audience may be, even if it's professional, even if it's an internal. So this is very important. And it's very important for the commission that projects get uh, people from outside the projects benefit from what's going on. So guarantee that it's not just the ones directly participating in the projects that, uh, are, um, are ben that benefit from the project. So you need to have a plan to promote what you are doing, what you are going to do, but also the results. Especially if you were talking about the project about capacity building or transmitting skills to the sector. It's not about doing something that will be there closed within the, the few, the little few that participated. And I'm not just talking about the partners. Even when you, if you do conferences, that it cannot stay within the range of people that attend in the conference. You need to broaden the results. This is really, really important. Okay, so this call will open every year, has been opening and it will continue to open every year. This year it will open around uh, last quarter, around September. I don't have a definite uh, date yet. Um, what you need to know is that after you submit, it takes six months. The evaluation period takes six, six months. So this is not a, a short-term project. This is a project that you know that you will have to do it. It will take you about eight months to prepare the application. I don't advise you to take less than eight months to prepare an application. Mm -hmm. And then you'll need six months waiting. And once you get the results, then your costs are eligible. Which costs are eligible? Everything. There is no, there is nothing that we can say it's not eligible. But maybe if you want to build a house, it's not eligible. But only, it's not in the regulations. It's only not eligible because you won't be able to fit the building of that house in one of those priorities. I have asked this, and that's exactly how they, what they answer. It's not, it's not not eligible, but how are you going to argue in favor of that? I just checked the website. Yes. There's actually a program for uh, privately owned, owned heritage houses. <laughs> yes, but that's not for building. Oh, okay. Yes, and it's not within the scheme. It's in, within the cross-sectoral scheme that we talked in the beginning, and it's for best practices in the management of of those houses. Of those houses. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's not. I, I don't have one. <laughs> That's a pity. I don't have one either. I would like to. Was uh, my. Okay. I'm going to finish. Networks and uh, platforms. I just wanted to say to you that networks have been are all about different from this that we have been talking about. Networks are all about skills and capacity building for the sector. There are a number of networks that have been selected that are part of the beneficiaries that are doing a huge amount of work pro the sector and are very important, namely in the, what Mathieu is going to talk about, about the, the, the new initiatives, the influencing policies. So get involved, go to the website, look for the projects that have been selected and get involved with those networks. European platforms, different, totally different objective to publicize arts and artists. So we're talking big projects of, uh, that, that involve different um, venues that have sh uh, shows for European uh, uh, artists, for instance, that kind of thing. We also have uh, quite a number of platforms in your sector that have been uh, selected. And in this case, one of the obligations of those platforms is that every year they have to get in new partners. So take a look at them. Take a look at, at those platforms. This is the, well, it's really not legible. But uh, <laughs> very sorry for that. But uh, this is, was a quick search I did in the search engine in the, 
the database of selected projects. And you have here some ETEP. I think you all heard about ETEP. You have Live Europe, for instance. Those are all platforms that are supported by Creative Europe. So get, get to know them, get involved. And uh, don't forget we are here to help you. Creative Europe Desk are here to help you. Thank you. These are my contacts. <laughs> So I know. Yeah. The word so much. it's my turn. Um, so thank you very much, Susanna, for giving us the broad overview. So I'll talk about a more recent initiative, which also comes from the European Commission. I don't work for the European Commission myself. I work for Impala. It's the European Association of Independent Music Companies. So independent record labels. Uh, our membership is made of labels, uh, some of which you will know, of course, some of the bigger ones uh, like Ninja Tunes, Beggars, PS, and then also a network of trade associations across Europe. Uh, in Portugal, Nuno, who introduced the panel, uh, is the president of AMAI, so that's the National Association of Independent Music Companies. So we're based in Brussels, so I tend to speak a bit of Brusselese, as mm -hmm. Susanna said, so please don't hesitate to interrupt me if if I start uh, talking about things you don't understand, uh, EU lingo. So we're based in Brussels and my role there is really to um, get involved with the EU institutions on a range of issues. So it can be copyright, competition, mm -hmm. access to finance is a big one. So some of the things, I, I won't spend too much time on that, but for example, we're working a lot to address what we call the value gap. So that's the fact that some platforms online are not sharing the value created by works fairly with the artists and independent music companies and all the others involved. So that's something we're trying to solve at the moment. The commission tabled a proposal. We're at the very last stages of that. Uh, competition, for example, in the recorded music sector, uh, you have three major music companies, uh, Warner, Sony, and Universal, who together hold 80% of the market share. And then you have thousands of smaller labels some of whom are our members, and they represent only 20 to 30% of the market share, but they represent 80% of all the new music releases. So their input in terms of uh, diversity of music released is really huge and it's crucial. Um, so to come to today's discussion, as Susanna has showed us, um, there are already some programs at European Union level to support the culture and creative uh, sectors. I don't can't remember the earlier slides, but uh, Creative Europe is made of three main uh, sub-programs. So there's the media program, culture, culture and, and cross-sectoral. Cross and the media program is what could be called a sector-specific program in the sense that it's only for the audiovisual sector. So music cannot tap into this sub-program. And it represents, I think, 800 million euros out of... Uh, 56%. 56% of the whole envelope. So a big chunk of that money is going to audiovisual. Uh, so the commission realized that and they noticed uh, that within the culture sub-program, if you look at music and the contribution of music sector, uh, of course there's the cultural contribution, the social contribution, but even in economic terms, the contribution is quite huge and studies have showed that in recent years, it's I think over 1 million jobs in Europe, 25 1. billion 7. euros. 1.7 million jobs. Right. So a lot of jobs, a lot of turnover. It's one of the bigger uh, culture and creative sectors. But if you look at the money, and we've heard there are some great programs in the music sector being financed mm -hmm. by uh, the European Union through Creative Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. Inesh, who are uh, sponsoring or hosting this panel, are one of them. Live Europe, We Are Europe, there are plenty, plenty. of them. But still, they only represent 3% of the overall Creative Europe envelope. So of this envelope, which is supposed to go to all sectors, only 3% goes to music. And the Creative Europe program itself, as you said, is one of the smaller programs of the whole EU budget. It's only 0.15%. So if you look at the contribution of the cultural sector and within that of the music sector to the European economy, we give a lot more than we get back. And I think there was a realization from the commission about this. So they started discussions in 2015 where they basically brought organizations from across the music sector to sit down in a room and start a dialogue with the, the European Commission. The idea being, um, can we help 
better understand the needs of the sector and what tools we might be able to develop uh, together. So there were a series of workshops uh, which we attended throughout the year 2016. Mm -hmm. And that led to a report where basically they identified the main concerns uh, in the sector, namely access to finance, lack of diversity. So that comes back to what I said earlier about the, especially on our side, the recorded music sector being very fragmented. So even though all the music in the world is basically available on streaming platforms, it's quite hard to cut through the noise and for people to get their music heard. Um, other issues were, so getting your, your music across borders, so you tend to work within territories, but it's quite hard to break the borders and break your artists uh, across European Union territories. Uh, education and training was one, so also getting because we're in the sector, I mean, our members, for example, are all businesses, but they're not necessarily all of them that experienced in presenting their business models, for example, to banks. So when it comes to getting money, how do you best present? Uh, also, just get up to speed generally. But empowerment of the, the yeah. sector. So they listed all these issues. Uh, and the first step, I'll tell you where we are now, but the first step was to try to get what they call pilot projects. Because as Susanna explained, the EU works in seven years program. So the last one started in 2014. We're right in the middle of it. And the new one is for 2021. So basically to prepare the ground for this next program, the idea was to start a pilot project with a smaller envelope of money to test some ideas. Uh, and that is done through the European Parliament, so another institution. They're the ones who have this money that they can unlock for different projects. So the Commission tried the first time to get a pilot project. For different reasons, it failed. That was last year. And uh, so they tabled a new one, and this time it's been adopted. And now in a few weeks, I think at the end of this month or beginning of next, they will uh, start launching the calls. So it's basically the idea of what Susanna presented, but on a, a much smaller scale to test ideas that could then be replicated for this bigger program. So the real objective is to get within the next generation of programs a dedicated strand for music. So like you have one for media, and it will probably not be as big, but the commission is quite committed to this idea. Um, of course, it's all subject to I won't go into those details, but all the member states basically have to agree on how much they give uh, to the European Union. You mentioned Brexit, that's going to create a, a big shortfall uh, in terms of money allocated to the general EU budget. So they have to decide basically on priorities, what are, where, where are they going to put the money? And we're pushing a lot with a lot of other organizations to make sure that uh, a proportionate amount of money is going to the successor of the Creative Europe program, and within that to make sure that music has enough budget uh, to work on, a, to have its own program basically. So that's where I think it's interesting to have these conversations in these types of conferences because it's all about what are the needs and tools of the music sector. So you're the best place to know uh, what type of projects could be m most beneficial to you. So I, I would, uh, advise you, I don't know if you're part of organizations nationally or regionally, but through those organizations to start the conversation and then maybe uh, up to the point and also meeting people like Susanna who are basically acting as the contact point for the commission locally <laughs> and start this conversation about what can be done for you uh, within these projects. So of course it has to be, it has to have a European dimension because you already have normally it depends on the country, they don't all have the same level of support for music or the creative groups, uh, creative sectors. But the idea is that at European Union level, it has to have a EU added value. So it has to be like a cross-border cross element. So the mo mobility of artists or repertoire across Europe, uh, diversity on streaming platforms would fall into this. Uh, part yeah, online distribution, partnering with other, uh, with your counterparts in other countries to build projects. Um, so that's basically where we are now with the pilot project with calls to be launched soon. They have five strands identified, which were m more or less in line with the issues that they identified during the talks. Uh, so the five strands are 
there will be two call for tenders for mapping the sector. So there the idea is to get better data about the sector because right now data is quite scarce. We don't really have the, the right figures for what the music sector represents in terms of jobs, who works where, uh, where, is, the, where is the money basically flowing, basically getting a bit better picture of the music sector. There will be another call for tender for export. So there the idea is how to help uh, local music scene export. So outside Europe, but also internally uh, across countries. And then you will have calls for project. Uh, so for online, offline distribution, education and training. And then there's a fifth strand, which is basically starting a more structured dialogue with the sector. So they will have like four or five meetings every year with the commission, get people in a room and exchange. But so here you already have first opportunities if you have ideas, maybe in terms of training or cooperation projects with uh, other organizations in other countries. And then this is only the first step, as I said, towards a bigger EU music program. So there again, there we have more time to work on what we think should be in these programs. But I really invite you all to start uh, being part of these conversations. If you have any idea of where the European Union could help. Where can uh, I find uh, the information for those pilot programs? Pilot program, it's online. Like, uh, we can send you the link if you want after the... Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Basically, you can find if you, if you put in, in, the, in Google Music Moves Europe, which is the name of the initiative, uh, you'll find it. You'll find the link right away. We'll be happy, yeah. happy to to send you all the the, um, the results of the preparatory What's works. The Music moves Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I guess the calls will be published on that website. The, the calls will be published on the website for the Portuguese people here. We will be publishing them on our website. So subscribe our newsletter. I promise we only send newsletters when there's something really useful to be said. I don't have, you know, I just, <laughs> so, uh, well, this, this, I, I, I would like to, to thank you for stressing the need for participation because uh, this is one of my goals for, has been for the last four years and will continue to be. We need to participate, all sectors need to participate in networks. So Impala has been participating in this debate under Music Moves Europe and others, of course, from the beginning because together networks have a strength uh, that individually you will not have. It, it, this happens at national, regional, and European level, of course. So this is the time to get to get involved, to see what people are doing, that, and to to contribute. It's uh, it's really important. Yeah, and one more thing, I don't, I think you mentioned it, but there's uh, within the existing programs there's a strand which has a what they call the cultural and creative sector guarantee facility. So it's a, oh. I think you touched upon it, it's a it's a loan guarantee instrument. So basically the commission there allocated, I think initially 120 million euros, 121. Um, which is basically used to help banks uh, look at the music sector, and uh, not just the music sector, mm. actually all creative sectors. All creative sectors. And the idea is to get banks interested in lending more money uh, because you probably all know that it's quite difficult to go to your bank and convince them to lend you money, uh, whether it be for a production of an album, promotion. And so to get them more interested, they launched this instrument, which took a bit of time to, to start, but now we're really starting to see the first agreement. So they're signing agreements country by country. I think, I don't know, like five countries have five, been covered so far. Like France, covered. Romania, Spain, Twi two Czech, from Spain. Czech Republic. I'm and missing one. Others will come. Belgium. Mm -hmm. uh, we were part together of a meeting also with Nuno and some banks to, to start, uh, because there are no agreements so far in Portugal, but to get to start the discussion, basically. Exactly. So th this, is, this is basically a bank guarantee for banks. So we all know how difficult it is, because banks don't have risk assessment on the cultural sector, because they think, they believe, that it's not worth even to spend money on risk assessment for the cultural sector. So uh, what, what the European Union is doing is attacking this problem in two ways. Uh, creating this grant facility that you'll say, you're a bank, you want to create your own, your loan 
portfolio for the cultural sector. Present me an application, an application. Tell me what kind of loans you will, you want to, to 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 present to the cultural sector, and I will assess your your application, and I will say it very well. If you do this, we guarantee you that if something goes wrong, seventy percent of the money that you spend on one project will be uh, you you will recover, or twenty five percent if it's a case of a portfolio. So this will just help uh, fight this uh, problem of banks don't really being open to the cultural sector. On the same time, this is linked to what uh, Mathieu has said about uh, creating an observatory for the, for the music sector, because data is fragmented. When we have it, it is almost all together, all together in, with the performing arts in, as all, well, so it's very difficult to. And what is happening is that the, the sector is being um, in, in disadvantage, so it, 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 the data does not give the real uh, impact of the sector in the economy. So this is all linking together. In Portugal, we started to have meetings with the banking association, uh, which were committed from the projects. I must I must say they were very open to it. They contacted some banks, and coincidentally, Mathieu and Nuno contacted me uh, in order to promote together a meeting within banks and the cultural mm -hmm. sector and and uh, and the banking association and we had that yesterday and it's all going well so I hope that soon we'll have some application from the Portuguese bank. And those loans that they can be the 40 or 50 percent of the economic scale of the project of the project on investment? That that is that that then depends on the on on the what the bank wants to wants to wants to do. I don't I, I cannot tell you exactly what are the terms, but what what happened is the commission launched an, uh, a guideline for like for any other application, okay, and say, Mr. <coughs> ladies and gentlemen of the banks, for you to have this bank guarantee, you have to create a portfolio, and the portfolio must have. These and these and these and these and these characteristics that will meet the needs of the cultural sector. Okay, if it's 50% or not, I cannot tell you, but I will be happy to find that out for you and let you know. So you just give me a line or a call, and uh, I will do that. So it's not on at the moment in Portugal. No, there's no Portuguese bank uh, uh, yet associated, but we hope that very soon. Yeah. So we, if you're based in Portugal, we encourage you to go to your banks and push them maybe yes, to get involved very important. because now they very know important. about it now and if you're based somewhere else maybe there are already agreements in place and then we encourage you to go to your banks again and see which ones are signed up and uh, try to get your loan because if they feel there's that there's demand and pressure well basically we'll all be pressuring for for yeah. all the side possible sides and also, you said it's for the whole creative sector, so music is only one of the, ver of the many sectors who can benefit. So if, if we don't use it, yeah. the money will just go somewhere yes. else. First come, first serve. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 resu <laughs> the results will come out in June. In June? June. So it's six months. Okay. <laughs> not before. Normally, they are not late with the, the, way, with the results, with the but when... Mm -hmm. so they were late with the application. What, what, I, I, out in November. I mean, I'll tell you what what happened. They they, they were late. They they wanted to keep the started. calendar. They had to. They want to keep the calendar opening in July, closing in October. That was the initial calendar. Okay. So what happened was what you I think you most of you have heard about the um, European Youth Orchestra that didn't had the money and then there was this big commotion and then President Juncker came came out and said they are going to be supported and so that resulted in the, the Commission having to alter all the framework all, all the budgets which then has to be discussed and then has to be voted by the member states which then has to be blah 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 so until this all signed it they decided yes this is what we're going to do they could not open the call, so it was it was a big uh, it was a big stress for everyone because the agency itself, which is responsible for the execution of the program, also has objectives and they also have to fulfill them. And if they don't, they'll hmm. things happen to them too. So it, it it was unfortunate. And what happened is that once they, well, the, the, the the last one was late, they couldn't recover the time to go back to the initial calendar. So this year it will open again in September, 
And what they clo they only they closed in January because of Christmas. So people were, weren't going to be prepared and uh, send the application. So you can blame the orchestra. You can blame the orchestra and Christmas and Christmas vacations. <laughs> One little thing, I'm sorry. I only talked about projects from networks and platforms. Big mistake. Because Westway is supported by Creative Europe. And I was so happy that that happened this year. <laughs> so <laughs> it's supported through the INIS project. So the project that was submitted was INIS and the seven partners. And I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm very happy that it happened. It's more than just.